Okay. Um, just a bit in terms of uh, people that signed up for the webinar. We have 107 people that signed up for the webinar. The number went up this morning. Uh, we're sitting at 121 people that signed up for the webinar. And uh, we have uh, people from Botswana, Eswatini, Lesotho, uh, all the way to Zambia. So thank you very much uh, for all signing up. And uh, in terms of our split, we have uh, 48 uh, females and 52 males. There are some that chose not to indicate. Uh, you are also still welcome. Oh. In terms of uh, sectoral representation, we have uh, firms that are in agribusiness space and then specialty foods. So specialty foods, we are referring to uh, commodities such as uh, honey uh, and related uh, products. We also have vent crafts and accessories and other sectors uh, that are not classified. Um, our guest of honor today uh, for this uh, event is uh, Dr. Takele Tasu. He is with the uh, USAID Regional uh, Economic Growth Office uh, based here in Pretoria, which is the USAID office that oversees the whole of the SADC region. Uh, Dr. Tesu is also the coordinator of uh, Feed the Future uh, initiative across the whole region. Uh, in addition to being the regional agriculture and trade advisor uh, uh, in USA and uh, Southern Africa uh, regional growth, growth, economic growth office. Um, in addition to managing the uh, trade hub, investment hub, he also manages the trade project. What does that mean? That means that he is the technical lead within USAID who oversees the work that we do within the hub as well as within the regional seed trade project. So without much ado, I'm going to invite uh, uh, Dr. Takele to give us his opening remarks. Uh, thank you, Golden. Can everyone hear me? We can hear yes, you, but well, it's a bit low, Takele. Yes, yes. yes indeed. Can, you hear you? can you hear me now? Yes, we can yes, hear you. Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Please go ahead. All right. Okay. All right. Uh, sorry. In ideal world, we would have been sitting face to face uh, physically, but uh, here we are. And uh, thank you uh, so much for joining us at this uh, important online event. And we do appreciate your time and uh, we are delighted uh, many of you are uh, decided to join us and uh, thank you. Uh, as Golden said, uh, my role at uh, USAID, Southern Africa Regional Mission that oversees the 16 SADA countries is uh, primarily uh, coordinating the agriculture and trade activities uh, to the United States as well as to South Africa and between, between countries in the region. Uh, through the Southern Africa Trade and Investment Hub, um, for short we call the hub, uh, USAID has been a proud uh, partner to South Af Southern African firms who are seeking to export to South Africa as well as to the United States. These markets uh, present a significant advantage, as you know. If you look at the South African market, it is distinguished by its size, and its proximity, meaning that the South African market is very close to uh, those countries in the region. And if you look at the US market, it offers incentive under the African Growth and Opportunity Act or AGOA. In both markets, however, as many of you know more than I do, is the ultimate test of an exporter success is whether it can reach to the end consumer and make a deal or complete the sales, right? So as many of you already know that, that can be costly, right? Uh, market research, uh, packaging, understanding the market, uh, both uh, monetarily and otherwise is very costly. Much of the cost comes from having to research new markets, deciding how best to overcome those barriers to entries. And so it's very challenging, right? Now the good news here is that uh, the Trade Hub uh, working with successful exporters like our panelists today, 
has gathered those much of those research information. Through this practical experience, uh, our, our firms like Rugwani Juice, Black Mamba, and, and others um, have helped inform the trade hubs export focused research. In other words, we use them and they are the key, right? They did it, they know it, and therefore they we will hear from them what it takes to export both to within the region to South Africa or internationally to the uh, United States. In that regard, we are very fortunate today to hear from these firms directly. Their insights will give you a first-hand look at what it takes to move your products to international markets. And to help bring all of these insights together, the trade app also will be sharing an overview of the market level research it has conducted with more than a dozen successful exporters, both in the region and internationally. This research has revealed consistent themes from understanding and complying with certification standards to packaging and marketing products, exporting firms face similar, similar challenges. As we hear about these challenges and discuss ways to address them, please know that USAID through its trade hub remains committed to supporting trade in Southern African products. By facilitating linkages with other exporters and with buyers in destination markets, the trade hub seeks to develop sustainable solution for unlocking Southern African trade, which is critical for regional growth. I thank you all for being part of this effort and I look forward to our session today. Thank you. Golden, over to you. Thanks a lot, uh, Takele. Uh, uh, much appreciated for your opening uh, remarks. Um, I, I will now share uh, with you just an outline of the program that uh, we have before us today. So we have uh, received the opening remarks uh, from Dr. Takele. Uh, we will now get into the plenary session where I'm going to share the highlights of the, uh, uh, the research that we conducted. And after that, uh, we'll then uh, get into the panel discussion where we invite uh, the four, uh, three export firms and one buyer uh, to share some insights with us. We'll then open it up for all of us to discuss and uh, take a look at uh, the next steps. So without much ado, uh, let me start with the case studies that we logged at. So what we did is we, we went through the database of firms uh, that we've worked with over the years. And uh, in that regard, we selected firms on the basis of four criteria. The first criteria was to look at the deal model innovation. In other words, what was innovative about that particular deal? Then we looked at the type, size, and business model of the deal. In, in terms of how many actors are involved, what does it entail, is it a regional or international deal? And then we looked at, uh, from the lessons that we're learning from this deal, can it uh, influence systemic change? In other words, by undertaking this deal, to what extent has it inf influenced other actors in the market? And then lastly, we looked at the inclusivity and value chain linkages. Uh, how one deal had a spillover effect to other market actors uh, within the uh, value chain. And out of the analysis uh, of which we are only sharing snippets with you today, we identified five critical success factors uh, for any deals to take place, export deals to take place. The first one was to do with uh, the production and marketing. Uh, we identified that uh, a number of the deals, they worked in the sense that they responded to what the buyers required. For instance, we had uh, deals 
where private labeling and letting the buyer build the product brand became the feature. So instead of uh, having to concern the export firm with going to the US, trying to establish uh, linkages, trying to establish uh, customer outlets, the arrangement was actually finding buyers that required product, but with their labels already, or buyers that required to get the product from the exporter and then handle the product branding within the export market. And that entailed partnerships between large exporters and smaller exporters in a way that leveraged the capabilities of the two firms, but enabled a better market entry as well as a sharing of working capital demands of uh, the export deals. The, the second area that came strongly was uh, the effective uh, supply chain logistics. Understanding the end-to-end -end solutions uh, of uh, the transactions required from the source country all the way to the buying country and working on issues such as border clearance, warehousing of the products, as well as online payment systems. So in other words, understanding the anatomy of a deal in terms of who are the actors who are involved, what paperwork needs to be completed, what monies need to be paid, what risks need to be managed within the deal uh, from origination of the deal all the way to the end customer. The third area uh, that featured quite strongly was the, buyer, the area of buyer relationships uh, in terms of uh, having knowledge of the end market. And in this instance, uh, a number of successful companies that were exporting managed to work with trade promotion service providers in the end markets. So in other words, if a company was in Zambia and wanted to export to South Africa, it's a, it identified a trade promotion service provider who understood the market requirements in South Africa and then fed those back to the exporter so that the exporter could comply with product specifications, quality specifications, paperwork required, and so forth. And that also then involved working with a diverse range of buyers because the trade promotion service providers have connections into several buyers. And instead of the exporter worrying about finding the buyers, the trade promotion service provider then becomes a link who finds the buyers and opens the doors for the exporter. And this worked not just in South Africa, but also in the US and in other markets. The fourth area was that of international certification. Uh, it was key for most exporters to have credible uh, lab analysis and quality management systems in place, which assured consistent quality of product and supply. That assurance of uh, the products uh, created confidence in the buyers which enabled the export companies to reach uh, several buyers because of that assurance uh, that they are certified either for ISO, either for ASIP, or any other such certifications as required by the buyers. The fifth area was that of uh, working capital and insurance. Uh, a number of the exporters uh, reported the need for balancing between regional and international sales to manage current risk. Uh, as you can imagine, uh, some buyers will only pay when the commodities have arrived in, uh, in the export market. So a number of the firms have started negotiating in terms of part payment before the consignment leaves uh, for the export market. And in situations where they are selling to uh, markets like the US, uh, it's securing uh, insurance to ensure that if the product is rejected in the market, they have got cover. 
Uh, also, the element of uh, securing uh, loans for raw material purchases. Securing loans for uh, the purchase of uh, raw materials, uh, which becomes uh, an important element in terms of uh, bringing in capital providers to work with uh, uh, the export firms. Uh, what we learned in terms of uh, the process for market entry, in other words, how do ex successful export companies get into those markets? We identified three themes or three practices that uh, firms were following. The first one was uh, market research on product trends. Successful firms invest in market research and this takes the form of uh, one, looking at product trends and consumer trends, and two, attending trade shows. Uh, and most firms that have been successful through trade shows have not only gone once, they've gone several times, and in the process created credibility with the buyers and confidence with the buyers, which then resulted in uh, opening of negotiations for trade deals. The, the second area was that of matching products to market segments. In other words, an exporter understands that the South African market has particular requirements, the US market has particular requirements, and they distinguish the products that they produce to ensure that they are really speaking to those uh, market segments, but also speaking to the packaging requirements, the quality requirements. The third area that uh, companies successfully utilized was that of leveraging government trade agreements. So in, for instance, if a company is in Eswatini, before even thinking of exporting, they identified opportunities to work with uh, the government trade desks to understand what are the trade agreements that are already available between Eswatini and South Africa, between Eswatini and the US and other markets. And in the process, they then utilized those uh, trade agreements, but also utilized the linkages uh, and information that is available from these government agencies. One of the questions that we asked the exporters was, now that you've successfully exported, what would you advise uh, for the first time exporters and they identified six areas that are on the slide. I'm not going to read all of them, but essentially uh, the long and short of it is that they encourage exporters to learn from each other. Uh, you will be surprised how many successful exporters are willing to share their experiences and there's no need to fail twice when somebody has already failed and learned the lesson, uh, the easiest way is to just go to them and learn from them. The other important area that they were emphasizing was the knowledge of the customer and uh, payment terms. To understand those upfront and ensuring that uh, whatever negotiations you undertake, you ask the right questions and you manage the risk of uh, non-payment. And that also uh, speaks to the buyers. The buyers were talking about the importance of uh, the due diligence of suppliers in terms of ensuring that any suppliers that they work with, in this case exporters, they have conducted due diligence on them and they know that they will, be, they will have the capacity to deliver. And lastly, the, the confidence in your product came through as an important area. And the, 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 the point that was being made here was that a number of exporters uh, go into the negotiations from a back foot position where they are begging the buyer to buy, as opposed to selling the salient aspects of their commodity or their product uh, as a good product for which they are confident and uh, they are not begging the buyer. Uh, the exporters also spoke about additional strategies to close export deals. 
and uh, key amongst those were spending time in the market, including visiting the market to actually understand the consumers, see products that they are buying, how they are buying them, not just attend a trade show and end at the trade event, but actually go into town, see supermarkets, see areas where your product may be uh, sold. I will not spend too much time on this. Uh, we shall be sharing the slides. Um, at this point, I, I want to um, invite uh, Francis to, to come in. Uh, but before I do that, I want to introduce our key speakers. You didn't come to hear me, you came to hear the real exporters. I'm not an exporter myself. So who are they? So our first uh, exporter uh, is uh, Wesley Brown. He is the general manager of Rugani Juice. They are based here in Johannesburg uh, in South Africa. And Wesley uh, runs an operation uh, that uh, processes uh, uh, carrot. They are the largest carrot producer in Southern Africa. Um, as you can see from the slide, they account for up to 40% of the region's carrot supplies. That's uh, no mean feat. And uh, they have been exporting to the US, uh, the EU, Japan, Hong Kong, and the United Arab Emirates. So we'll be looking to hear from them in terms of how they've been doing it. So Wesley will take us through that. We also have uh, Claudia uh, Castellanos, uh, who is the co-founder and managing director of Black Mamba Foods uh, based in Eswatini. And uh, they work with smallholder farmers who supply them with raw materials. They process uh, chilies that are in demand uh, globally. Uh, they export to South Africa, they export to the US, they export to Europe and uh, uh, many other places. And she will be telling us about uh, that. And then we have uh, Mr. Henry Massina, who is the managing director of uh, Dalitso General Suppliers. Uh, uh, his company employs 850 uh, permanent staff and a further 2,000 temporary workers. Uh, he is into commodity trading and uh, he is very passionate about community development, having started off as a teacher. So he still has uh, his roots uh, on the ground working with uh, smallholder farmers uh, in their thousands uh, in Malawi. And he has been exporting to Kenya, Rwanda, Zimbabwe, uh, and lately to South Africa. And uh, the fourth uh, delegate is uh, Mr. Andrew Makenete, who is uh, the director of Talana Agricultural Investment Group. He is based uh, in South Africa. He runs uh, one of the largest uh, horticulture uh, uh, outfits in the South African market. But in addition to that, he sources commodities from the region uh, for school supplementary feeding as well as uh, supply to the army uh, and prisons and many other places. He works with uh, several large agribusinesses uh, such as the Rhodes Food Group for which he is a board member um, and he is interested in diversifying his sources of supply from the region. So with that I want to uh, invite uh, Francis uh, to take us through the uh, deliberations. Thank you very much, Golden, and thank you for your presentation and sharing the, the high-level findings of, of the research that we've been carrying out. And so, as Golden said, I'm Francis Fraser. I'm the Portfolio Manager for South Africa at the Hub. And today I would like to thank Wesley, Claudia, Henry and Andrew for agreeing to share with us their personal experiences um, about exporting into South Africa and into the US and for putting in a bit of preparation ahead of today. Thank you for investing in that and for being willing to share. Um, I think Golden's presentation really highlighted that learning from others that have been there and learnt the hard lessons um, is one of the key ways to, to learn quickly and to succeed. 
So um, just in terms of the way we will work, I'm going to start by posing each of the panelists with a few questions. While I'm doing that, please feel free to post questions that you have in the chat box. Uh, we'll have half an hour after, after I've engaged with the panelists to also have questions and answers from the floor. And uh, if you could just hold your questions and, until that stage, but you can start posting them in the chat box. If I do need clarification on any of your questions, please be ready to unmute and put your video on so that we can see you and so that we can engage with you and connect. Um, as much as we're not in the same room, it helps to, to see each other's faces and smiles. And um, so, yeah, please just be ready to have your, your microphone on. So let's start off with Wesley. Um, as, as we've heard from Golden, Wesley has extensive export experience um, in, amongst the US and other places. Wesley, maybe just to start us off, um, could you tell us a bit more about that export experience? How long have you been doing so and um, what are some of your insights? Thank you, Francis, and hello to everyone. I just want to take the opportunity just to thank the South African Trade and Investment Hub for the opportunity. Um, and thank you to Dr. Golden and Dr. Zakele for um, their insights. I think going through the insights of the, the, um, the study that was conducted, obviously a lot of those things resonate with um, our approach. Uh, just to give a very brief overview, we have been making juice, um, vegetable juices in South Africa since 2016. So it's just on five years now. And um, Immediately when we started producing, we realized that the South African or local market would not be big enough to take up the demand for our product. And I think um, in times like these, uh, as we sit in the, in the circumstances that we sit in, we know as businesses that diversification is a very important part um, of our businesses now, even more so than it has been in the past. So as soon as we started, we, we started to look for opportunities to export our product it was something completely new for us, as was the whole um, juice game. But we um, put a lot of energy and effort into looking for the different markets that we could approach. Um, and up to 20% of our current revenue is now derived from export markets. So it's been a, a good adventure so far, but we think that we can still um, find more markets overseas um, to sell our product or grow the markets that we're currently in to help provide a more stable platform for our business um, in trying times. If the local market comes under pressure, we still have other outlets for our products. Um, and that's led us to um, the US, Japan, Hong Kong, um, most of the SADC region, the Indian Ocean Islands, uh, as well as a little bit in the Middle East, uh, the UAE, Saudi Arabia, and a couple of other countries in that region. Thanks, Wesley. I think one of the interesting things that I observed when, when we visited um, your juicing factory was the, the fact that you have you would have so much waste of carrots if you didn't actually um, use the misshapen but very good carrots um, in, in the juices. So it's great that that, that wastage isn't happening. Um, so the whole juicing um, aspect of your business that's led to these exports is and that big contribution to your revenue is is really interesting and um, during the interview with you when we were doing the research you mentioned that you focused um, your initial exports on English speaking markets because uh, you, you assumed that those would be the easiest export opportunities um, can you take us through some of the other criteria that you considered when you were choosing where to export to um. You know, I think the mostly what I want to say today, and if I can uh, use this opportunity to express that, is that we all know that there's opportunity in exports, and it's about uh, I think for a lot of firms, we try and find the easiest route um, to market or uh, the opportunity, or they say the lowest hanging fruit, um, and um, we decided early on that we would focus on English speaking countries because it would be the easiest to communicate and get around and um, begin to understand the market. I think um, like some of the points that were highlighted um, earlier is that you need to know and understand the market. And that's one of the biggest focuses that we've um, put in um, learning how to export. It's about 
being there, it's about going into the stores and seeing how the customers interact and understanding the supply chains. And that's a hell of a lot difficult um, when there's a language barrier on top of um, completely different cultural um, approaches to things. So um, we decided to look for environments where um, not necessarily English speaking only countries, but where English was um, uh, more widely accepted. I think we still have a lot of opportunity in the Far East, but it's very difficult uh, because communication is difficult as well as the um, cultural and uh, different approaches to business. It's a lot more to learn. So if you start somewhere where you can at least speak to a person, you can learn a lot faster and see what's going on and understand it uh, much quicker. So I think um, also just to that point, if we look at, and I think we all understand the opportunities around um, exports. I don't want to go too much into those details, but if we look at, uh, you know, the state of New York has a uh, $1.6 trillion GDP. That's four times the size of the whole of South Africa. That's just one state in the United States. Um, Tokyo City has a um, GDP of 1.6 trillion US dollars. It's more than four times the GDP of South Africa. So there's definitely huge opportunity and there's so many other cities and regions around the world um, where there, there is huge, huge opportunities, far bigger than uh, the whole economy of, this, of South Africa. Um, and it's about understanding where the best fit is and where you can um, relate to the people best so that you can get the process moving quicker. Mm, thanks, Wesley. I think you're really emphasizing the point that you've got to know that market. You've got to invest the time to understand the consumers, understand the way business works, really relate to, to that market and link your product to, to that so that it's relevant and interesting. Thanks for highlighting that. Um, I think one of the other really interesting aspects of, of what I learned from you is that after you went to the trade show um, with the hub support, it took 18 months before you actually had your first uh, shipment of juice going over to the US um, under a private label. And um, it would be very interesting to understand what you went through in that period and maybe how your perceptions of the market and your ideas of how you would get into the US market perhaps changed over that period and, and what you went through. Yeah, I think um, it'd be a very good example of um, how you need to be adaptable and you need to um, adjust to the challenges that you face. I think um, just to give a little bit of background, we come from a, it's a family operated business. Um, uh, as Golden said, we supply 40% of Southern Africa's carrots. Um, so it's based on a primary agriculture um, model. And um, we have been very proud in our company that we only supply products under our own label um, on the primary agriculture side. When you buy a bag of Regani carrots, um, it's always got the Regani logo on um, no product leaves our facility in terms of fresh produce without a brand. And um, so private label was something that we've been approached on over the years um, in operating the farm for the last 30 years that many people, um, or our internal perception is that we would not go the private label route. But once we um, attended the trade show in New York and we started interacting with the buyers and uh, started to unravel more of the challenges and the complexities around the opportunities of exporting, we started to realize that there are um, if we wanted to break into the biggest economy in the world, either we need to throw a lot of money at it or we need to look for an alternate approach. And, um, you know, over that time, as you said, it was 18 months from the time we first presented the product to the time we first shipped um, uh, product overseas, a lot of things changed. And I think, um, as uh, Golden highlighted, there's a lot of costs that go into exporting that we don't realize are there up front. Um, there's research, there's packaging, there's, uh, you know, travel and freight. Sending samples up and down um, has become one of our biggest costs as we aggressively uh, focus on the export markets. You know, every time you DHL samples overseas, um, our product is heavy. It costs a few thousand rand and those costs start to rack up. Um, then there's insurance and those are uh, really just the behind the scenes costs. That doesn't include um, the front end like marketing or returns or damages or anything like that. And, um, you know, as we began to analyze the market, we realized as a 
upcoming um, company with a very exciting product, we didn't necessarily have the working capital to invest in um, packaging. So um, I think it's different for a lot of firms, but our kind of packaging is pre-printed. It's aseptic packaging. It has large runs. So we have to print around about 250,000 units minimum um, per product or per SKU, uh, which is um, quite a lot. You know, if you're doing honey and you can put a, a US label with the correct nutritional information, it's much easier to customize and change that. But with our kind of product, the cost of um, changing and adapting is much higher. So um, as we looked at the different challenges, number one, the packaging and making it compliant, we realized either we need to put a sticker over this or we need to print new packaging, which was not a financially viable option. Um, then we looked at the marketing to break into the market um, can cost a lot of dollars, which we didn't have, and the exchange rate is changing all the time. Um, so we decided um, in partnership with the importer that we would focus on uh, launching a private label. And that, um, when we presented it back to the team and to the board, um, everyone was in agreement that it would be the best approach for the US market. Number one, it takes the um, pressure of, uh, or the cost of the working capital of the packaging off, um, and also puts a, it, it kind of creates a, a built-in offtake agreement because the customer is doing their own private label and they're responsible for the packaging. They have to order a minimum run of each unit, whether they take all of that product at once or over a period of time, we've created a sustainable route to market there um, where they've invested their money up front in their packaging um, and has created a sustainable business for us. So. Um, it was definitely not the thing that we were planning to do when we landed um, in New York in 2017, but it's been one of the most uh, lucrative deals that we've done as a business. Sure. Thanks, Wesley. There's so many nuggets of, of great uh, lessons and information in there. And I think just to I mean, be very practical, so the off-taker in the US literally prints out all of these, um, the packaging, ships it over to South Africa, and then the packaging actually happens at the processing plant in South Africa and then gets shipped over. Uh, and that cash flow of actually, you know, producing all of that packaging um, is what, what Wesley's touching on there. And I, I really, um, I, I think it also highlights the fact that you can't be stuck on a specific approach to entering a market. You're really highlighting that uh, need for agility and adaptability. So thank you very yeah, much. If I can just yeah. add as well, it's not, it's not that all of our deals are structured that way. We only have one private label deal, which is the US market at the moment, but we've managed to break into um, Japan, which is the world's third biggest economy um, with our product. And um, I think it was number six on there about knowing your product. That was one of the points that I definitely highlighted. Uh, I would be interested to know if the other panelists said the same because a lot of the times going into the negotiation, you sit in front of a buyer and, and you really want this export and he starts throwing, well, I can get this product cheaper here or there or from this country or that country. And you really have to know the, um, the salient features of your product. And we know that we've developed a unique product. Yes, we're a bunch of farmers in South Africa. Um, what do we know about um, uh, juicing? But we've managed to put together a really unique product, which is a world's first. We're using technology that's used nowhere else in the world. And we, as much as we wanted to break into various export markets, we had to stick to um, knowing and understanding the value of our product because we could have been um, either on the back foot in terms of our pricing um, based on what the buyers were looking for or the pressure that they try to put on us. So I think it's very important to know what you have and what it's worth. Um, and with this specific deal um, with the customers that we have now and one or two of the other customers I have, um, the, they said that they can get a cheaper product from another part of the world. And I said, well, um, if you know the key selling points, I told them, you know, uh, is it, does it have the shelf life ours has? Does it have preservatives added? Does it have sugar added? By knowing the key product features, I told them what to look for when they're comparing the two products, not just look at the price. Mm -hmm. And it happened twice. It was a bit of a gamble. Tell the guy, well, if you can get it with these key features, else cheaper, then go buy it there. 
Um, and uh, both times within a month or so, the company comes back and says, no, well, your product is definitely what we're looking for and much better than the quality of that product. And they're willing to pay. And then the negotiation ends. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think it's, it's important to understand what you have before you give it away. Yeah, and I think it's typical of, I don't want to say South Africans, but companies to think that um, we have something that's inferior, but especially when it comes to fresh produce, when it comes to agro processed products, we have the best in the world. Um, our citrus is all over the world. Our fruit is all over the world. And there's no reason why our agro processed products, our honey, our sources, whatever the case might be, can't be there and have that same um, and we don't have to give it away. Right. Thanks, Wesley. I think, again, some great nuggets there uh, in terms of negotiating, holding your ground, knowing your product. And uh, nice that you mentioned Citrus. I see Justin Chadwick is with us from uh, Citrus Growers Association. So thank you for joining us. Um, I'm going to move on to our next panelist now. Thanks, Wesley. Uh, we will thank open you. up the door a bit later for a few other questions. I've seen a few coming in. Um, so thank Claudia you. is based out of Eswatini. And um, she is a long-term part partner of the Hub. And Claudia, um, in our discussions and in the interview with you uh, during the research, you spoke a bit about uh, trade shows and how they've been key in terms of um, Black Mamba entering into new export markets. Um, in what ways do you think trade shows are effective and what are their potential shortcomings? Because they're certainly not the only way to, to connect with buyers. Could you just share your insights into trade shows versus other alternatives? Um, hi, Francis. And uh, first of all, I just wanted to check that everybody can hear me clearly. Good. Um, thanks so much to you and to obviously um, to Golden, to all the Southern Africa Trade Hub for inviting me here. I think it, I bring a nice perspective for um, slightly smaller business. Uh, that has managed anyway kind of a decent footprint in terms of export and also thanks so much for all the effort that you're doing to to allow us to be there in the in the big export market so and um, that being said according to your question um trade shows is definitely a very interesting way to start um a, an international approach to markets and I think that the positive things of a trade show, uh, and it's something that we were discussing before, even if you cannot have yet the funds or the capacity to be um, an exhibitor, it is very interesting if you can to attend trade shows as market research that allows you to um, understand the market, something that Wesley was saying very clearly. I think we, I 100% agree with everything he said. You need to first understand the market you're going to get into. So that's a very good thing of doing market research. Also in terms of um, trade shows, it's very important to know based on our experience that usually you don't necessarily get a deal straight away the first time you do a trade show. It usually takes time and usually buyers tend to trust businesses that they see more than once. So it's not get discouraged if the first time you go to the trade show, you don't come with a deal. It usually will happen after you start learning the trust of the market and, as, um, and when you start learning exactly how the market works and the different sort of regulations according to that market. Um, but for us, um, the challenge of the trade show is sometimes the fact that you, it can be difficult to discern the, the right key buyer that comes to your stand versus the person that is there just because they want a little bit of a taste of the product or they want to chat. So it tends to be very intense in terms of the work that you do and in terms of the, the, the filtering of the right people that you want to talk to. So you learn that also through experience with trade shows. Um, for Black Mamba, we said trade shows. We've had, had, I would say, out of our buyers, probably two that come from trade shows. Um, we've had a very good experience and successful experience with buyer missions. Southern Africa Trade Hub has organized um, quite a few buyer missions and that is excellent for a brand like Black Mamba because um, we do believe that the personal touch and actually being able to show the buyers what we do. Black Mamba has a very strong ethos in terms of the social and environmental commitment. And most buyers, um, when they see that happening in situ, directly in Eswatini, that makes them almost get an emotional connection to the brand, which is very important for us. So buyers missions have helped us a lot into getting very sound, um, very sound uh, buyers 
Um, like one of our biggest US buyers is actually buying from us because of this, because they got the chance to see the work that we were doing the growers, the, 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 the reality of what we were saying on our emails and our beautiful presentations. So that works very well. And another thing that I think is very relevant also due to the norm, to the nowadays context when obviously, you know, nobody can really travel. It's very important to the trade shows of buyers missions. We've done a really strong focus on our um, online strategy. And that not necessarily means e-commerce. Um, Eswatini has a very big logistics, like logistical challenges in terms of exporting, you know, like one bottle, if somebody orders one bottle of black mamba, the sort of logistics are very expensive for us to send. But what we do in terms of our online um, marketing is have a very good website with great SEO, so search engine optimization, so that people can find what you do on your website that is user-friendly, that is updated constantly, and also a very sound, um, I would say, social media strategy. Before social media for us was, because we're under, understaffed as many kind of like smaller businesses, was for me on the spur of the moment, putting a nice image and a really nice comment, but there was nothing behind that. When you start actually doing something very sound and very strategic in terms of the call for action, in terms of the sort of, not only what you post and the content that you post, but also the sort of, engagement that you get with all the people that have become influencers or potential buyers what we've noticed especially more recently is we've been getting a lot of um, requests about how to bring our products to other countries and also call for action for people in those countries where we are already present to kind of like foster more sales so i think that's also something to really um, be thinking of as, as a brand um, especially because, as I said before, the traveling part, it's actually quite complicated at the moment. Who knows how it's going to like, retake in the, in the near future. Thanks, Claudia. Um, I think the online presence and really having an active social media campaign is uh, it's great advice. And it's just enhanced, as you say, under the current market conditions. I just want to check, can everyone hear Claudia okay? It might be a little bit soft if you can... But it's not bad, but you could maybe, if you can yes. speak slightly louder, that would be great. Awesome. Thank you. Um, <laughs> in your interview, you also mentioned how country trade agreements and regulations can be an obstacle in terms of exporting. Um, so maybe, do you have any advice for firms that are um, exporting into South Africa? What are some of the critical success factors around, around that aspect? Um, I would say trade agreements are not necessarily an obstacle, but the implementation of the trade agreements usually change from country to country and from officer to officer, especially in Africa, unfortunately. So we found the, the red tape quite frustrating at some point. So I would say um, one of the best things that we've done is actually create a great relationship with our customs department in Eswatini. Once you have a great relationship, you might have to have a direct contact every time you're going to be exporting to a new country. Every country has different regulations. And obviously, you know, you've got to be super excited and then you have a new customer in Norway and they're really keen on buying your product straight away. But it's so important that you actually go to your office, to your export office, customs office, whatever the office that works with exports is in your country and tell them, guys, I have a new customer here. What do I need to do? In SOT, for instance, you have to be registered as an exporter for that specific market. Otherwise, your products would never reach that market. So I don't know if it's the same with other countries, but it's very, very important that you actually understand those regulations, that you understand the tariff codes of your products, and also the sort of duties or taxes that you have to pay to export those products. Because that's also extremely relevant for your pricing points and also as a potential incentive for your buyers. We, for Europe, for instance, um, most of the SADC countries, I think, sorry, so all the SADC countries have um, the possibility of entering countries duty-free, which is great. So it's something that we need to take advantage of. Also for the US, either via AGOA or GSP, we're finding other sorts of agreements with other countries. For instance, Swatini has a great one with Taiwan. So taking advantage of that when you're looking at markets would be great also. Finding the great sort of, um, sorry, a good relationship with your customs department that will allow you to understand how that market works. And also from your buyers. Sometimes your buyers are very good at um, knowing, letting you know the sort of specific regulations where you're talking about food. is extremely important that 
understanding that the labeling regulations or the food safety regulations change from country to country. So it's very important that you know what you need to do for that specific country so that your products, when they reach the new country, they don't get stuck there. We had a, um, an issue at some point with a, with a, a, one of our shipments the stuck in, in the U.S. customs for like two weeks because of a, a small issue that we had with the label. So something that you want to prevent beforehand. And if you're talking about South Africa in particular, I would say for all of us that come from smaller countries in South Africa could become, um, you know, like a very relevant market at the moment. And for us, the main thing about South Africa has been to, besides obviously understanding the main regulations and the border sort of trade agreements, um, et cetera, et cetera, has been to also get a good local partner. I think that's extremely important. It's very difficult for a smaller business to be able to deal directly with everything in South Africa in terms of logistics. So a good um, transporter, a good distributor that understands your brand, understands your key selling points, but understands also the local um, sort of market. I think for us, getting a good distributor has been um, really, really good in that case. Mm. Thanks, Claudia. I think those are great, great insights. Um, it is a lot of information that you kind of have to assimilate when you go into a new market and that you've got to decipher. Um, and I think particularly for the US, that's something that we're working on right now in terms of making sure that we've got data available in terms of how you make use of Agora. How do you, how do you actually deal with all of the documentation and, and the shipping and all of those small details that can cause lots of headaches at border posts. Um, so yeah, thanks for highlighting that. Um, one of the other challenges you mentioned in your interview was the impact that all of this can have on your cash flow. Because, it, because things take a bit longer, you know, your cash flow gets pu pushed out to, to its kind of limits. Um, how did you manage those demands on, on your cash flow um, when you were starting to export? It is very difficult. I think even nowadays it's still very difficult, but I think um, it is very important to um, get your payment terms clear with your customer from the beginning. Sometimes you're allowed to actually demand those trading terms. Sometimes if the customer, you know, is very big and it's very potential for you, you have to kind of like follow their trading terms and their payment terms. Um, in our case, I think we've been very lucky as the fact that we've always been trying to push the sort of fair trade aspect of our business and fair trade buyers um, just because of their status as fair trade are very good in terms of giving you 50% of your paying up front which allows you to finance your order and then 50% of the paying once the order has been shipped depending on your um, trading terms so if it's an FOB is CIF, so it's very important also, I guess, as an exporter to understand those terms and see which terms work for you. Um, another thing that you can do to finance that, there are, of course, banks. You know, an overdraft would be a good way to actually finance that order if it's a large order. Another thing that we found um, during times is there are other international organizations that are very good at financing um, smaller or, or not smaller like companies in, in developing world there's one that we work with very closely called shared interest so they act as a bank but usually they have better um, interest rates so that could be another way of financing um, your orders and i think very very important is to balance if you can regional and international like something that um, golden was mentioning on his first findings that allows to actually cover at some point the risk of a market of payments coming from one market from another market. And the last thing I would say is also the currency fluctuation. The RAND is a currency that fluctuates terribly. <laughs> so sometimes you win, sometimes you lose. So we always discuss, have a very good and open transparent relationship with your buyers. So that at some point, if there's something like what's happening now with the RAND, or in the other way around, it's a strengthening a lot, saying, guys, I gave you prices before, but now my you know, profit on my products has fallen by 30%, so we need to discuss new prices. Usually when you come with a good approach and an open and transparent approach, your buyers are very interested in listening to you and working with you to make something forward, moving forward. Hmm. Lovely insights, thank you. Um, I, I think the volatility of the RAND is, is something that we have to be very careful with. Uh, and obviously, there's the opportunity of trading in hard currency as well, which would give your business that if, if your exchange controls allow for that. 
Thank you, Claudia. I'm going to move on to our next panelist now, and that is um, Henry Messina from Malawi. Um, we've had some really exciting uh, recent experience with Henry importing into South Africa. Henry um, has extensive experience in the region in terms of exporting to Zimbabwe and other places, as Golden mentioned. Um, Mr. Messina, can you share with us a bit about your experience of exporting into South Africa in particular in comparison to some of the other places where you've handled exports? Uh, Francis? Yes, Golden. I'm not seeing him online. Um, he's under the name Prosper, not Prosper. Uh, he's, yeah. Let me find him. Thanks. Because Mr. Mestino, we don't hear you yet. Okay, I think you're unmuted now. There we go, we see you, but you appear to be muted from mm -hmm. my end. Mr. Massina, can you please unmute? There we go. Perfect. Yes. Ah, uh, thank you very much. I, I hope you hear me. Perfect. We do. Oh, thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Yes. Um, uh, exporting to South Africa, um, it needs some special attention as comparing to other countries. Uh, that is a general surprise is uh, based in Malawi and uh, we are uh, full-time in a commodity that is uh, soya beans, groundnuts, uh, sugar beans, rice and other commodities. We have been exporting to other countries like Kenya, we have been exporting to Tanzania, Rwanda, Burundi, Mozambique. But uh, this year we have just started exporting to South Africa and we have noticed that uh, exporting to South Africa, it needs some special attention in terms of uh, uh, a special and quality control. Uh, for example, um, when we are having these uh, produce from farmers, when we are buying from farmers, we call it farm grade. Other countries like, uh, um, as I've said, Kenya, uh, Rwanda, Burundi, uh, Mozambique, Zambia, sometimes they get they can buy farm grade as it is uh, the way you buy from farmers. But in South Africa, you need to have uh, it uh, well cleaned. You clean it, you check the moisture, you check the uh, all uh, like specifications, uh, the nutrient uh, components. These are some of the things which we consider, especially when we are exporting to South African uh, markets. And also, uh, you know, South Africa from Malawi, it's very far. We pass through uh, Mozambique, uh, we pass through Zimbabwe up to South Africa. So we have so many uh, logistic challenges in terms of uh, transportation. But uh, what you need is uh, to make sure that you have the proper, proper documents. The moment you have proper documents uh, exporting to South Africa, it becomes very simple. And in South Africa, um, we are still exploring some markets. We are, as of now, we have two buyers. We are, as we are talking now, our trucks are on the way to South Africa. Yesterday, we dispatched three trucks. Last week, we offloaded some trucks already in South Africa. And we are happy that uh, our buyers uh, are very happy with our commodity in terms of quality. So I think, uh, in short, this is her, my, my experience. Uh, exporting to South Africa. As I've said, uh, we need a lot of documentation. For example, um, you need the full specifications of the crop, like uh, the moisture content. Soya, soya, we need to have 9.7% uh, moisture content. And the, even the protein margin, the protein content should be 21%. Oil content should be 18, something like that. On top of that, if you want to win the market in South Africa, you also need to have the, you know, Malawi, we produce non-GMO. We don't have GMO in Malawi. So you need to produce the 
uh, the non GMO certificate to make sure that uh, uh, those guys there that have that certificate that this is non GMO. And also, before you send the, the, the produce to South Africa, unlike uh, other countries, you need to fumigate. Fumigation for more than seven days, make sure that uh, uh, all the live insects are dead. And also, um, you need to, 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 to attach all those documents uh, uh, and also you need to have the uh, phytonostalite uh, certificate and also the SADIC documents. These are some of, the, uh, some of the things which we have experienced when we are exporting um, our produce uh, to South Africa. Now we have started with soya beans. Uh, we have the groundnuts, we have uh, pigeon peas, we have sugar beans in our warehouses. We are still looking for the market uh, in South Africa and in other countries. But uh, as I've said, this is the only uh, uh, experience for us when we are export uh, exporting our produce from Malawi to South Africa. Thanks, Mr. Messina. I think um, you're really highlighting how important it is to have all of those detailed documents in place, because if you get to the border without the SADC certificates, you're going to have to pay duties. If you get there without the phytosanitary certificates and the fumigation and all of those documents, you're going to face challenges. Um, and I think that's an area where you actually are an expert and you've um, shown us um, what's required in the Malawian market to succeed in terms of crossing all of those borders on the way to Bait Bridge. Um, I know that you also had some challenges with the journey. Um, do you want to share a little bit about some of the things that perhaps were a bit difficult in terms of actually entering the South African market? Yeah, as I've said that um, uh, if we're not exporting to South Africa uh, from Malawi. Um, the first thing, we need to get the, the details of the buyer for us to get the export permit from the government of Malawi. So using that document, you apply for the export document. The moment you have the export document, then you start uh, all the processes, cleaning, sorting, and all those, th those type of things. So uh, we load the trucks in 30 tons, uh, the Excel and the 34, the, the, those are the super link on road. That's a road transport. Uh, from here in Zimbabwe, they also need some documents. We make sure that the track, they have all those type of documents. And also in Mozambique, we also have those things. But uh, we are happy that uh, on the South African side, we don't have much problems as comparing to uh, when we are crossing Mozambique and uh, Zimbabwe. So uh, once our track is at Bed Bridge, the moment it is cleared, from Bed Beach is sent away to the to the buyer. But in in in, in other countries we have uh, so many things. But we managed to get all those back so that uh, we don't have uh, much of those challenges when we are exporting to to South Africa. Mm -hmm. Mr. Messina, do you want to talk a bit about um, the VAT and also you mentioned previously about some of the issues around pricing? Uh, and um, and the need for volumes for the, the deal to make sense. Yes, yes, yes. Um, when we're entering South Africa, um, previously we thought that maybe um, we don't need to pay uh, VAT in South Africa. But at the border, um, from our first track, is when we realized that uh, we have to pay the VAT. And we, ne we do negotiate with the buyers that... Uh, we pay VAT on their account so that maybe they can claim it back to us later on uh, when submitting their their accounts to the to SARS. and also um, and but that one uh, is one of the challenge because uh, the moment they are making the payment, they deduct uh, that VAT uh, from our payment. So it means that um, uh, suppose you you are supposed to get. Uh, maybe 10,000 runs, you have paid VAT. They have paid VAT on your behalf 2,000 runs. It means you are going to get 8,000 runs. The remaining 2,000 runs, they will pay you maybe after a month or so after uh, submitting their documents to, to the government of South Africa. So it, this one is also affected us because, you know, in the business, we have to make uh, some sort of cash rotation. 
and also um, in South Africa, um, uh, after flooding the goods, uh, we are paid after I think seven days uh, upon submission of the of the documents. So uh, these are some of the challenges which we have, and also the price. We are happy that um, after delivering our two laws to one customer that is 30 tons each, 60 tons, uh, when he saw that uh, the quality is good and he was happy with the, uh, the way we presented our club, uh, he increased the price. He gave us 250 uh, rand on top of the agreed price. So we are pushing that uh, if possible uh, as a hub, if you manage to to assist uh, us in terms of pricing, at least we can cover some of the challenges in South Africa. As you as you have said that before you send the you send these things to South Africa, we need to clean, we need to fumigate, we need to do all the type of documentation. These are these are the payments which are also paying to these institutions to get those documents. So I think. Um, uh, we, we ask the hub if, if you can manage to talk with the buyers so that at least uh, they can add something on top of the agreed price. Uh, we can cover up some of the challenges. Thanks, Mr. Messina. I think you highlighting the importance of really being able to also negotiate um, and, and kind of explain some of the costs that are being incurred, the risks. But it's good to also see that um, with um, experience and as buyers learn to trust um, you and and the whole deal that hopefully the prices will increase um, uh, and they see the quality so uh, that's something that we're observing um, I think the VAT point is also really key in terms of the terms that you agree um, with with South African buyers um, it is something that's claimable as long as they are VAT registered and they've got an import code um, but that's some lessons that we learned in the process of, of this deal. So thank you for sharing those uh, insights, Henry. I'm going to thank move on to our, <laughs> I'm going to move on thank to our next you. panelist. I'm sure there will be a lot of questions from everyone. Um, but we've got one more speaker, and then we will revert to questions. Mr. Makaniti, Andrew, um, thank you very much for joining us today as our um, representative of South African buyers. Um, we appreciate your, your input and time. Um, I, I think we've had several discussions around different trade deals as well as your involvement in the research that we recently conducted. And you've shared some great insights for us in terms of some of the realities that face South African buyers. Um, so it would be really important for, for us to understand what are some of the criteria that you consider when you think about importing from firms in the region. Uh, thank you, Francis, and thank you to, to Golden and to the team. I hope you can all hear me clearly. Um, even, one, even before one begins, uh, um, it's nice to, to hear from uh, one of our neighbors to the north, uh, from um, Rugani. Um, it's interesting, I don't think uh, he, he mentioned uh, a very interesting fact, and I think uh, I, I would like to mention it because it's, it's very important in our discussion. But uh, Rugani is obviously the largest carrot producer in, 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 in the southern, in southern African space. But they are also partners to the largest tomato producer in the, in the same space. And uh, the reason I'm mentioning it is because when you talk about trade, the key about trade is typically economies of scale. And when you don't have scale, and I think Claudio mentioned it as well, when you don't have scale, it is incredibly difficult to trade, particularly across border. And, and so when you, when you mention what is our challenge, it's always around, can we get the right scale? Because the minute we have the right scale, then from a pricing perspective, Pricing doesn't become such a such an issue, but the, if you are, if you don't have scale, then you really are talking in that you need to be in a very very high margin business, and unfortunately, uh, when you are a, a 
black SMME uh, as we are, we are typically not initially in a trading at the margins. Now, when you are trading at the margins and you don't have, can I call it, uh, that margin uh, opportunity, it, it makes the, the whole process very uh, To start by replying to your question, uh, I think one of our biggest challenges. Andrew, sorry, we're losing connection with you a little bit. I don't know if it's just me. Um, maybe I could suggest, unfortunately, we might have to lose your video so we can hear you better. I assume it's not only me that can't hear Andrew right now. Can somebody just let me know? I am back on. Sorry about that. No problem, Andrew. Um, please go ahead. I think we'll just have to proceed without your video because we can hear you well now. Thanks. Okay, let me switch off the video because that does make the thing unstable. Yes, so the point I was saying, so the issues about, about economies of scale are very, very important. Uh, I think that a number of the issues that were highlighted by Golden when he introduced the, the, the topic are particularly important. Uh, our challenge, and, 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 I'm, and I'm speaking as a supplier into the school and the government feeding schemes, uh, both at hospitals and into the army, the reason we are, we, are, we are operating in that space is precisely because to try to operate into the, what I'd call the commercial retail space in South Africa as a small supplier is incredibly difficult. I think the point that was raised from the gentleman from Malawi and everybody else is that in South Africa, for whatever reason, we have gone the route of a very, very high compliance and standards uh, uh, way of trading or way of doing business. Now, when you, are, when you are trying to get into the business and your compliance standards, both from, both from a documentation point of view, but also from, you know, like I said, do you have the health and safety standards and all these protocols make it extremely difficult uh, to trade. So what we have tried to do, and I think it's something that uh, we should note, is to begin to look at what we are calling alternative supply channels i.e. not follow the typical big root supply channels, but to follow the smaller supply channels where as you are saying, can we get product from Mozambique or from Malawi for beans, whether it's soyas or whether it's for dry beans, that come in at a cheaper rate through a different supply channel than the traditional ones. Now, of course, as you are saying, that requires quite a lot of your own investigations, your, your own research, uh, trying to establish the context. So all those barriers that you are, uh, you are raising uh, are, are typically the same barriers that we have actually had to face. I know when we got product, even just getting it DHL from, from Mozambique was a bit of a challenge, getting it to the right place. Then when we have got it, you know, are we sure that we can confirm that there's going to be a consistency of the same product, the same supply? Is that product going to be available for the whole term? So if we're in the school feeding program, we can't one day say we have the dry beans and the next day we are having to change that supply channel and go back to a traditional supply channel. So those are all the things that are most important. And I think, like I said, the trade hub is beginning to help us to understand the strength of our potential partners in the region. Uh, and they're helping us to cut down our costs from a due diligence point of view because we can't actually afford to go do the due diligence. Uh, in these countries. So we need somebody to help us with doing the due diligence to, quality, to, to, to really clarify that these, these, these suppliers or these actors have the quality standards that we're looking for. So I think those, those are my, my initial comments. But like I said, uh, the, the, the issue is around the products we typically are dealing with are low margin. So we need scale, we need volume. Then we need, as, as we are all saying, is quality and quality assurance and quality supply. But I do agree, some of the quality assurance standards we have in South Africa are simply too high and negate the ability to, for us to trade on the continent. Mm, thanks, Andrew. I think one of the things that you're highlighting now and also in the interview is, 
you know, given that you're supplying um, big buyers in South Africa, um, you need that consistent supply. Um, do you have specific advice in terms of ways in which um, exporters should deal with that? Um, is it aggregating with others? Is it, um, you know, having multiple suppliers? Any, any ideas in terms of how to manage that risk? It is a mixture of all the things that you're suggesting. Um, uh, in our own experience, uh, and I'll just say to the gentleman from Regani, we work very closely with Pin Pinocchio Farms and, and Ditla. And what we have done there is we've begun to aggregate smallholder farmers uh, so that they can then bring their products and then feed into, a, into an established supply chain. So the whole notion of aggregation is, is very, very important. Uh, and, and, I'll, and I'll assume that uh, the, the suppliers coming in from, from Malawi or Mozambique or Zambia, uh, they are also beginning to use aggregation tools to make sure that when they have an order for 300 tons of, let's say, dry beans, uh, we know that there's no individual smallholder farmer or, or group of smallholder farmers that can supply. But we don't want to take that responsibility. It has to be the responsibility of that supplier to aggregate to quality assure, to get those things through an aggregation of getting those farmers, whether it's through a cooperative or whether it's through another system, to make sure that it is their responsibility to aggregate and to supply us to the, to the standards that we're looking for. So the point of aggregation is, is, is very, very key. Um, and, and, and our view is, is that uh, uh, government, particularly in, in, our, in the Southern African region, should really be helping enable people to aggregate so that they can actually lower the costs of, 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 of supplying into a group. I think the, the point has also been made uh, by a number of speakers is that the logistics costs are just too high. And without aggregation, it, uh, you, you simply can't survive because uh, the volumes are low. And, and like I say, if it's not a high value product, you need scale. But now when you have scale, then you don't have the logistics arrangements to, to make sure that you can participate. So I think the other point that you're making is aggregation and then somehow or another, somehow lowering the cost of, of, of doing the logistics or getting through the supply chains. Mm. Thanks. I think there's some nice connections with what Mr. Messina does in terms of linking hundreds of thousands of small holder farmers into a market through his business. And he's managed to commercialize that successfully. Um, but it talks and it's a, it's a case in terms of how important it is to achieve that scale to meet the demands in the South African market, but to also make the, the economics of the whole thing work. Um, I think you touched on it briefly, Andrew, but in our interview, you, you highlighted how the role that trade promotion agencies can play um, or that the hub could play in terms of vetting um, companies in the region. Can you just elaborate a bit more in terms of, of that and why that's so key and, and what it does to assist a business like yours? Yes, no, I, I think the point, the point that was being made is, for example, if I was to talk to, 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 to the supplier in, 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 in Malawi, we would need somebody to vet him. Uh, now, it, it costs a lot for us to fly up to Malawi to go see his business, to go understand how his business works, to understand his supply chains, is, is, is a cost which quite often is, is not bearable. Now, this is where I think the point was made. The trade promotions are very important, but also where government agencies like the development, I mean, the DTI in South Africa become very important in them facilitating or at least lowering the cost for us to go to, 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 to see these suppliers. But ultimately, when you have an agency like, like USAID and the, and, and the SATA, uh, the South African Trade Investment, we are, we are hoping that you provide us that kind of intervention. First of all, you might be able to, and this is what we have shared recently with you, you have actually given us the product lists that are coming in from, from the various countries. Now we can then go through that product list and say, okay, I'm actually inter interested in these products. And then we are actually hoping that you have already verified both the quality of the supplier plus also the authenticity of that supplier. Because then it, it, it gives us some reassurance that because we're dealing with a, with a, with a multi, can I call it a, an international organization, there's enough credibility behind the work that you do that then it, that, that then it immediately lowers our, our, our exposure to, 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 to the risk. Uh, I, I think that that is key. I think the next area which 
some people have highlighted, is this one around the payment platform. Uh, and I think one of the challenges we're all having is it seems we operate from different payment platforms. And, and I'm not sure whether it's your direct role or somebody's role where we, we do need to standardize somehow or another how we operate these payment, pay, payment platforms and arrangements. Because otherwise, uh, you, with, one, with one set of buyers or with one set of suppliers, you have one different payment platform with another set of another set of payment platforms. And I think that doesn't help. And I think the other one which was also raised is this whole issue of VAT. Uh, uh, VAT across SADAC is, is different in every single country. And, and, and that, that, that arrangement, I think, somehow needs to, 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 to be managed. And, and people hold on to your VAT payments. Uh, and then, of course, that, as has been said, puts you under, under cash flow pressure. Uh, and so somehow or another, that's, that's another area that somehow or another needs to be tackled with, with some level of urgency. Andrew, I think there's probably, you know, at a firm level, um, being aware of those things and being able to negotiate them as part of the trade deal is one way of handling it. But obviously at a policy level and at a regional level is um, a lot more long-term work that also could be done. I am going to stop there because there are lots of questions coming through and I'm slightly behind time here. So I'm going to start opening up questions to the floor. Um, if I can ask the panelists just to try and be brief so we can get through as many questions as we can quite quick fire responses if, if possible. Um, Wesley, the first one's for you, and it's about how do you um, how do you export perishable foods? How do you ensure the freshness of your juice by the time it reaches the US? Um, it's around the technology and the packaging. So it's an aseptic pack, which basically means it's completely sealed off from the oxygen or the air environment around it protects it from going off, gives it up to a 16 month shelf life. So it's all around technology and packaging. Super, thank you. Um, second one for you, Wesley, is how has the COVID-19 pandemic impacted on, on your market um, it, markets and how are you mitigating that impact? Um, I think the obviously the biggest, there's, there's about two or three different factors uh, that COVID presents to us. Number one, the uncertainty, um, which is the one that everyone deals with, is not knowing and the disruption of cycles. So um, where we would normally be receiving orders for certain markets um, during lockdown or before or after, um, uh, depending on the different countries from the export side of things, there's definitely be a, a disruption of trade. Um, but in terms of if we look at the local market, we've seen a 30% increase in the consumption of our products because of their health benefits. So we've had a positive spin off from that perspective. Um, although supply chains and discussions and meetings have been um, put under pressure, so it's difficult to meet with our retailers. Um, but I think the biggest impact for us is on the continuity and the future development of our market. I think uh, Claudia mentioned it and, and it's one of the biggest impacts we see. We believe in um, relationship marketing and face-to-face -face business. Um, which this kind of circumstances and I think the future, future is going to put a lot of pressure on. So I think the biggest impact of Corona right now is that most of us actually should be sitting in New York at the moment um, just after the fancy food show um, which was cancelled and those were the kind of things that have um, disrupted the cycle and uh, potential future business because um, not having to be able to have those meetings, not able to get those buyers um, onto your property to see your manufacturing process means a delay of um, future business. And I think that's the biggest impact of uh, COVID-19 on us. Mm, thanks. I think um, I just want to pick up on a couple of those points. We had a very interesting engagement with somebody from our home office um, recently who's, who's a food and agricultural supplier specialist in the US. And just talking about some of the trends that are occurring there in terms of of obviously a lot more e-commerce, um, a lot more home cooking and uh, as opposed to restaurants and canteens which used to dominate the market, sort of 60% of food would previously go through restaurants and canteens and how package sizes are even changing because people are going to the shops less frequently. Uh, so there's definitely a shake up in the whole market and I think you, you're touching on that um, very clearly in terms of how that also then impacts on your supply chains and how you engage. 
Right, we have another question for you, Wesley. I think it's because you were the first panelist, so they're all coming through in a wave. <laughs> the question is a bit more about um, the supply. Would you consider buying um, inputs from the region, so from, uh, from some of the other countries that the hub works in, uh, if you ran out of carrots? <laughs> Oh, well, carry on. <laughs> so I think on um, obviously the business model was developed around um, having access to raw materials, but we're constantly developing um, new products. You know, we started with just the carrot juice we have now, um, over 11 different variants that we sell. Um, and as Andrew points out, we're also willing to do joint ventures with other big um, farmers. And this is all about turning food that could have ended up being food waste, although it is still delicious, still nutritious, maybe just doesn't look so great into a, uh, a product that has value and is exportable or is storable for a longer period of time. So we definitely have to opportunities. Um, we are sourcing products like um, Moringa and uh, Sobo or hibiscus from other African countries um, to put into some of our products. Um, but uh, yeah, I think it, it depends on what the opportunity is. Mm, okay, so it's on a specific basis as you require kind of unique products that you could use as inputs. And um, maybe a question for Claudia now. Um, there's some comments about the fact that um, trade shows are often subsidized and supported by either the likes of the hub, but also uh, government agencies and trade promotion uh, entities, and that helps to to cover some of those costs um, and it means that you get to potentially engage with a lot of stakeholders. Um, the other option is also, we spoke about inward buy missions. What about outward supply missions? Have you had any um, experience with that and are they effective in terms of um, raising buyer interest and identifying buyers? Um, Francis, could you repeat what about what mission? I or I I didn't I missed that word. Sorry. <laughs> the outward supplier mission. So if you were to go uh, on a mission to the US to meet with a whole range of potential buyers, have you done that before? And do you think that that would be an effective um, approach? Definitely effective. I would say not as a standalone mission, but always kind of like um, linked to a trade show, which is what Southern Africa Trade Hub has been doing, where you can actually go to the trade show, but also go and visit potential buyers. Anything that allows you to connect directly with a buyer, we found much more effective than the cold approach of either, you know, being thrown there with a million other suppliers and other buyers, like a one-on-one -on -one connection. Maybe it's also because of, of of my background, you know, like being a South American previously before I became African, we value a lot of the direct relationship. And I've seen from experience that most of our customers are also very, even people from, you're talking Europe, you're talking Asia, you're talking the United States, they do value that sort of like personal connection. So anything related to missions where you're allowed to get a more, um, kind of like one-on-one -on -one relationship with buyers would be extremely beneficial to allow you to present your unique uniqueness as a brand or as a product to the to the right buyers. Mm, thank you. Um, maybe a question that anyone can respond to, but I'd, I'd be happy to hear from Mr. Messina. Um, what do you think the cost is of, of going through the learning process of, of going into a new market? I think you're all welcome to respond to this. Um, obviously, you're making a big investment in terms of learning about specific um, aspects of the market, sending samples, engaging about that. That's, that whole thing takes a big, um, a big investment. Any ballpark figures in terms of what you think that costs to enter into a new market? Um, Mr. Messina, you're on mute. Um, Mr. Messina, I think you have to unmute. We're not able to do so on our end. There we go. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. All right. Um, come again. I didn't get you, bro. No problem. I think the question is really how much do you think it costs you to go into a new market like in South Africa? How many trips did you spend? How much time? How much money did you have to invest before you had your first deal in South Africa um, very recently? 
Okay, uh, thank you very much. Um, the Little General Surprise, it's, um, it's one of the companies in Malawi which are mainly uh, buyers of uh, produce from farmers. In terms of uh, how much is the, we can uh, put in the business, it's, uh, it's a lot because we are in so many types of business like, as I said, groundnuts, we are in beans, we are in uh, sugar beans, we are in uh, pigeon peas, rice. So um, in South Africa as of now, we only have um, soya beans market. But uh, right now, as I'm talking in my warehouse, we are, have uh, groundnuts. Groundnuts, we have uh, these two different types of groundnuts. We have the, uh, the local one, which we call Chalimbana in our local language, the, the white one, and uh, the red ones, which we call CG7. We have those ones in our house. We have beans, rice, and other things. Um, from here to South Africa, um, in a truckload, it cost about, uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, 300 to 400,000 rands. As I've said that maybe uh, when we come to South African side, when we supply to the to the buyer, there's an issue of uh, VAT. On this one, I just want to add something on the VAT uh, to the hub, if possible. Um, can you talk to these buyers so that maybe when we are supplying them, they should give us a good solution in terms of the payment. We don't need to pay the VAT. When we are discussing the price, I think we should also look at the uh, clearing side because already here in Malawi, we have already invested in the in terms of, of exportation. So when we're exporting, we have paid a lot of uh, payments here like the export fees, uh, fumigation, uh, specifications and the like. And we are also paying again in South Africa. Mm -hmm. So in the best view, I think um, it doesn't give us uh, a good logic to pay for the second time in the second side, even though they are claiming that they will pay us back after claiming from the SARS, of which we don't know how much time it will take. Mm. So this will also affect uh, part of our uh, capital movement. So mm. on this one, I think you can take it, then you, at least you can talk to the buyers, they can consider so that maybe if when we are exporting there, the VAT, it should be on their side, not uh, us paying again it means we are paying for export we are as if we are also importing in south africa Thanks, yeah so this yeah. yeah so this is um some of the things which uh, we have experienced but in terms of the uh, south african market according to my experience uh it's a good market and the, the price is good uh the terms of payment is good and the uh, all this so, and these are the only things which you, we need to to consider in terms of the of the VAT. Thanks, Mr. Messina. I think you're touching on the costs in an indirect manner in terms of understanding what those VAT kind of um, uh, the understanding of the VAT and negotiating it, um, and uh, the number of costs that you incur in terms of ensuring you meet the different regulations and border controls. Uh, Wesley, did you want to react in terms of that investment cost that you would face in entering into a new market? Yeah, I think if I can touch on it, it's, it's very difficult to say a ballpark amount. Um, it depends on a lot of different things. Um, but I think if, you, if you're talking about looking for buyers, really you're going to have to invest um, a lot of time and money. The answer to your question is always more than you think it will cost, if I can put it that way. I think that, um, but it depends on um, your approach. You know, if you, uh, we've, we've looked at, um, because we're looking at it extensively, uh, I think it's very important to work with the different um, uh, trade promoters, to work with USAID and the hub, to work with um, your regional ones like Westgrow and the DTI. That's one way of bringing those costs down. Um, and then it really just boils down to um, um, your approach. If you're going to uh, a trade show and you want to catch a taxi everywhere, um, it's going to cost you a hell of a lot more than if you walk, if you take public transport. Um, so it really depends on approach and product. Um, mm. If you have a, a product that's very difficult to customize or change, then your investment is going to be much higher. But I think all of those things boil down to you need to identify them and then negotiate around that. I think mm. 
most people believe in negotiation. When you go into negotiation, you're only talking about the price. Um, what is the price for one product or 10 products? Um, where a price negotiation is actually much more complex. It's around terms. It's who's picking up, where they're picking up, where does the transfer ownership happen? Is it FOB or XWorks or is it CIF? Um, who's covering the cost of customization or adding labels, or whatever the case might be, to become compliant? And um, you need to understand all of those intricacies around the deal to make sure that you can mitigate those initial um, learning curve costs, if you want to call it that. Thanks, Wesley. Claudia, um, do you want to add anything? <laughs> Claudia? I could make a comment, if you don't mind. Yes, please, Andrew, go ahead. I, I think, uh, like you said, it's a... Uh, this question has got so many different aspects to it. It, it depends uh, whether you are you have the muscle already. For example, let's take the guys from Lugani, or on the other hand, if you are actually like uh, our colleagues from Malawi, trying to establish the market yourself from the beginning, and 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 in a way you're finding your way. And uh, we have been, as as you mentioned before, trying to help the Lesotho National Development Corporation to set up a market center in Lesotho. And uh, I can tell you, we have to date probably been to, to Lesotho over 20 times. <coughs> now, we haven't traded one. <laughs> now, you can imagine having been there over 20 times, been in negotiations, trying to understand the lay of the land, trying to create a platform for, for you to trade product in. And on the other hand, of course, you have to be very sensitive to that. They are also trying to promote local uh, Lesotho farmers to be able to enter into the market channel and then you are trying to decide which which of the products are not necessarily going to compete directly with with the local uh, producers uh, and then if you find the right product then you have to ask yourself the question is can I lend that product in at the right price to make it you know to make it worth your while to to to, to do that trade and so it, it's, it's it's very complex now uh, are we going to be able to necessarily recover? Uh, can I call it that investment to try to set up that market? Uh, I'm not. I'm not hundred percent sure. Now, the, the but the issue is if we if we haven't gone into trying to explore and develop that market, uh, uh, you you'll actually never get a get a result. So to to a certain extent, uh, uh, in in developing some of these trade markets, uh, like I said, uh, oh. it becomes very 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 important that those we are dealing with, in a sense, ease or reduce kind of call the compliance requirements or ease the ability to to trade requirements. Because like I said, uh, if when you get to that uh, entity or to try to deal with that party, and then the first thing is they put more and more of these hurdles. Yeah, it, it typically then makes it quite unattractive for you to 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 trade, but yeah, it's it, it's a it's a difficult question, and every single kind of trade has a different set of answers. But um, mm -hmm. uh, uh, I think I would agree with, with those who have commented that it's it's quite expensive to really actually start the platform. In many instances, mm -hmm. it's easier just to uh, go through an established marketing channel and and get going. But that is not always helpful, especially if your product is not a traditional uh, product. Mm. Thanks, Andrew. I think the comments coming through, and it's kind of at the heart of a lot of this, that there's a lot of unknowns. Uh, it's a big investment. It's not easy. It takes time. So it's not for the faint-hearted. I saw that comment coming through. Thank you for that. Claudia, do you want to add your experience in terms of the investments, in terms of entering new markets? You should be unmuted. Uh, Claudia, we see you, but we don't hear you. Oh, sorry. Yes. Oh, my God. I had an issue with connection. Would you mind just... Sorry, internet. <laughs> Repeating the question, if you don't mind. No. Um, the question is, um, the discussion's been about uh, the investment that it takes to enter into a new market. And the question was really about, can you put a ballpark to it? But I think the other panelists are really saying it's very difficult because there's so many aspects to entering into a new market. So I just wanted to touch on your experience in terms of you know, what would actually make that worthwhile? Is it actually worthwhile um, to even do that? It was so interesting that you mentioned that because when I was looking at the question on the side, on the chat, my eyes went like, you. I, <laughs> I wouldn't have any idea. But um, 
we started very small and um, the initial investment that we had to do was very well small in a way because I think the main thing as a food business that you need to invest is on your food safety certification and if you're willing to basically attract any market especially from what we do which is branded products is have excellent high quality packaging those things are very important and it's an investment either for international markets or local markets we believe so besides that specific investment on food safety certification and, and high quality packaging the investment specifically for markets um i have been I mean, you can start, like we said, we started in Germany very small and it was no additional investment versus these um, because of the payment terms that we had. If you're talking um, bigger sort of um, export, if you're talking containers, lies, something like that, there would be, I would say, the financing of your order that could be very expensive, especially if, if a company has like cash flow issues. Um, but again, I would say it's, it's very difficult because that depends a lot on the size of the market. If it's a niche market, if it's a more mass market, if you're going to start with very specialty sort of stores, or if you're going towards the GDO, so it, it would be very difficult to put a figure, I would say. Sorry. <laughs> no, I, I think it was an ambitious question, but thank you for, to my colleague for, for putting us there and challenging our panel to think about that. Um, I'm, there are a couple of other questions coming through uh, around supplies from the region, particularly fresh veggies from Iswatini. Um, but I think in, I'd like us to end off on time, um, ideally, today. So what I would like to do is just mention a few next steps. And if, they've, if there are connections and discussions that need to be made, we can most certainly do that. Um, so please just link up with us. So in terms of next steps, um, the first thing I wanted to mention is that we will be sharing the presentation um, immediately after this, along with a link for a feedback survey. Um, I know there's so many webinars and so many requests for feedback, but we really do appreciate the feedback that we get from you in terms of curating our future events. So please, if you have a moment, um, I think we're limiting it to six or eight questions, so it should not take long to, to have your feedback. Um, the second thing is we are writing up the research that Golden presented at the beginning of the webinar in a, in a paper, which will elaborate a bit more in terms of some of the findings that, that were extracted from that. Uh, and a big thank you to Dr. Mohave for, for driving that. Um, we have a very rigorous academic flair that forms part of, of that process that we went through, and it was, it was really worthwhile. So please look out for the paper that will come in a couple of weeks. We are also recording this session and we'll just do some quick edits and share that with you once it's ready in about a week. I also want to take this opportunity to mention that we have a series of events that we're planning, some with partners, some uh, on our own, um, that we will be advertising. Um, feel free to join those. We, we, love, we love it when people join. Sometimes they lead to deals, sometimes they lead to learning. They're not always going to lead to a million dollar check, but I think they each have a specific intention. So one of the upcoming events that we have uh, planned is around uh, e-commerce and how to enter e-commerce uh, market in the US. It will be next Tuesday, um, and Golden's gonna share um, a bit more information on that shortly. We're also planning a virtual trade event in the food space, which will probably be happening in um, early August. And we have some food safety training, food safety certification training that's coming up, as well as a 101 on shipping to the US, so some of the documents and the difficulties that people face. Um, we're also planning a number of events around AGOA and how to utilize AGOA. So these are things which are, are coming up. Um, don't join all of them if you think you're going to get fatigued, but please join the ones that you think are interesting. Um, to help us kind of um, curate these and answer to your needs, we would welcome your feedback right now in the chat box. Um, so if, if we were to hold future trade and investment learning events, what would you like to have covered? If you could please pop any, any thoughts into the chat box in terms of topics we can cover, um, areas that are unanswered for you uh, and where you think we can provide information and learning, please, please pop that into the chat box. Uh, and then I think the last point for me is 
We have country representatives in our eight priority countries in the region, um, and we will share those details on screen shortly. Um, so if you have any follow-up questions, please reach out to your country representative. They're there to have a relationship with you and to facilitate follow-ups, introductions, and linkages following um, this, this discussion. Um, with that, I want to again thank our panelists. I think there have been some tremendously great insights and lessons that have been learned at great expense and with great investment. Um, and I know that you put time and effort into preparing for this and that you always, from the first moment I spoke to, to all of you, in fact, you've been willing to share your, your knowledge and insights and experience. So a big thank you. Um, it's highly appreciated. And with that, I'm going to hand over to our Deputy Chief of Party, Mr. George McCorey. Thank you, George. Good morning, and um, um, I would like to uh, first uh, thank um, Dr. Takere uh, Tasu for our opening up uh, this discussion. And I also would like to uh, reiterate what uh, was uh, mentioned earlier uh, with regards to um, the, our appreciation as the hub uh, to the panelists, uh, the three exporters and one buyer. Uh, we, we thank you very much. Uh, it's uh, a lot of time that uh, you've taken away from your busy schedule uh, to come and share with everybody uh, your experiences. Uh, we thank you for that. I also would like to thank all the participants. Uh, I, I know it's a busy period. There are a lot of uh, things going on, but uh, you took the time and effort uh, to attempt this um, uh, discussion. And we appreciate that very much. Uh, it's a good way of us uh, continuing to, to interact. Um, we also would want to urge you uh, to continue to uh, interact with each other. Uh, as well as uh, with the um, panelists we had here. Uh, you'll be surprised how much information uh, we, we have uh, amongst ourselves. Uh, so it's important that we continue to interact with each other. There's a lot of, um, uh, a, a lot to learn from each other here. And uh, for those that have actually uh, been to the functions that we've organized in the past, like the Summer Fence Food Show, I, uh, and I think uh, Wesley can attest to that. Uh, it's not only the buyer out there in the US uh, or in other countries that can actually um, solve some of your uh, problems. You can actually end up meeting somebody who is uh, actually also exhibiting or who is actually here on this uh, uh, webinar who can actually then have, end up being your business partner. So we urge you to continue to interact uh, with each other. We also urge you to continue to reach out to the list that is uh, uh, there on the screen right now uh, of um, our country representatives. We now have um, representatives in all the uh, countries that we operate in, um, all the eight um, countries that they have operated in. Please reach out to them, uh, reach out to us. Uh, we can try and, and help as much as we can. I'm sure we all registered uh, when we attended uh, uh, this session. Um, we hope that uh, we do have all your details so that we can also continue to reach out to you and uh, continue to uh, try and help you solve some of the problems uh, that you will uh, be experiencing. Um, we're not saying we'll be able to solve all of those, uh, but we will do our best. Critically, we also would want to uh, send you the uh, recording, uh, like what Francis said, in terms of uh, um, the, the recording of the uh, recording of this webinar, so that uh, you you can be able to uh, listen to it again and uh, be able to then maybe reach out to some of the people uh, that uh, uh, can actually provide you the answers. Uh, with that, uh, thank you very much for attending. Wish you all the best, um, and um, let's continue to interact. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.